purchasing power of fiat money all over the world continues to decline. People are starting to feel the inflation, even in at the mothership country in the U.S., inflation is really starting to rage. And we see the wealth and income gap spread all over the world, and we see poverty rates increasing. That's a result of the fiat money system. So the, the tricks are not really working, and the we see it on the ground. There's a lot more social unrest, and I think that's what we would attribute to the fiat money system and the central banking system more than any political aspect. This is really the result of all this money printing. All right, here we go. Max and Stacy, the uh, now, I don't know, is it official or unofficial uh, tourism board of El Salvador? <laughs> uh, I got a lot to talk about. I'm excited that you've uh, taken the time to sit down and talk with me. So uh, thank you for that. Um, I want to before I want to talk about El Salvador. Obviously, uh, something I've been super excited about, which is like this passport system. I've been asking you guys about it since you went down there. Uh, I know there's news about that. I want to talk about that, but I want to start up a little bit higher up on the food chain if we can, and sort of talk about uh, maybe the example that El Salvador is really, really kind of creating for the world, and maybe the direction that the whole world seems to be shifting in. Maybe at this point, and. If you're looking at mainstream headlines, there's a rise of nationalism or far-right extremism sweeping across Europe and things like that. Um, obviously, I don't think either of us think about it like that. But really, maybe it is a, it, it is sort of the pendulum, as I call it, swinging back. Um, and I saw a tweet that I think Max had put out, which, by the way, I'm not, I haven't been on Twitter for five months now. Someone hacked into <laughs> my account, reset my 2FA, and I haven't been able to get in Twitter in five months. Uh, but... Uh, you said something about that living outside the U.S. for 20 years gave you an edge. And so I know I saw that there's a whole bunch of like old footage of you guys that's been resurfacing. You guys have been sharing and you've been talking about these types of topics, sort of, uh, you know, fiat money ruining the system, uh, the bankers, the kleptocracy there, um, even before Bitcoin. Um, and so what is this that uh, living outside the country for 20 years and reporting on this has sort of given you this edge to see how the world is shifting right now? Right. Uh, hi, Mark. Yeah. So, you know, the global empire uh, that is America is uh, debt driven. It's a it's a financial empire. And um, once you leave the United States, you see it more clearly how it works in other countries. And Max and Stacy have been reporting on this now for many years. Uh, Stacy and myself both uh, met as expats. We had both been living out of the country for many years. And so we came together and were able to speak uh, really on the same wavelength about kind of seeing the U.S. from this perspective of living outside of the U.S. And I think that's why our financial reporting had an edge to it, because we were able to put it into context of uh, the global economy and the way other people see it, other countries see it. And I think that's kind of what I was getting at there. Yeah, so just a different perspective. I know I, I travel a lot, so I, I understand that. Um, being in a debt-based economy, I mean, it's not just the United States. I mean, I know you were in, over in Europe quite a bit, reporting on Europe and, and, and so forth. I mean, that's also a debt-based monetary system as well. It's not the dollar, but I mean, they're still sort of on the dollar system or the euro dollar system or printing euros. Um, so, I mean, they're basically in the same boat. Sort of the whole world's in this fiat money boat, if you will. Yeah, exactly. And um, you're right. All the countries starting in 1971 went on a pure fiat money standard. Uh, Europe, uh, of course, has the European Central Bank and the Bank of England and the Federal Reserve Bank and Bank of Japan. And but they all kind of feed back to mother, the mothership that is the Federal Reserve Bank. Certainly after World War II, the U.S. took this global role as being the world's kind of banker. And um, as a result, uh, everybody kind of answers to what's happening in the U.S. Up until maybe things have gotten much different with the advent of Bitcoin and the geopolitics has changed somewhat. But yeah, you're right. Everyone is kind of in the same boat. So the, so the stuff that we're reporting on would relate to everybody has that understanding and they want to know why they live in this fiat money system, why it's so crummy. And um, so it does relate to everybody because they all because we're all living in a similar situation. It seems like, you know, for people that are paying attention and sort of understand this, um, it, it seems like, well, it doesn't just seem it is that the fiat money system is broken. It, it, it's, it's broken from the start. Um, I think it's probably a lot of people, you know, Harry Dent Jr. has been writing books for 12 years calling the end of, you know, the end of the market crash. People have been calling for the death of the dollar. 
on one hand, it seems like uh, the central bankers continue to have more and more magic tricks up their sleeve. And like, are we are you surprised how long they've been able to keep this charade going, I guess? Um, like I said, how many tricks they can pull up their sleeve? Well, I don't think it's really working because the uh, purchasing power of fiat money all over the world continues to decline. So, and people are starting to understand feel the inflation, even in at the mothership country in the U.S., inflation is really starting to rage. Yeah. And we see the wealth and income gap spread all over the world, and we see poverty rates increasing. That's a result of the fiat money system. So the, the tricks are not really working, and the we see it on the ground. There's a lot more social unrest, and I think yeah. that's what we would attribute toward to the fiat money system and the central banking system more than any political aspect. This is really the result of, of all this money printing. I would also add that I am not very surprised because, look, you have perfect money that is Bitcoin, and yet there are also like a million shit coins. Let's call them that. Yeah. And the reason why those exist is because of that fiat mentality. That is the majority of the population will always be like that. They will take the airdrops. They will take the student debt forgiveness. They will take the, the Biden bucks. They will take those free checks. They will take the PPP loans. They will do all that stuff, and that's what they like, and that keeps them in that system, and that keeps that system afloat. And so I'm not surprised that it exists because, look, uh, I just saw a headline that Joe Biden was considering a help to buy sort of scheme. Now, this is a scheme that will help 500,000 Americans buy their home. Well, Max and I were living in London back after the first financial crisis when, of course, of Satoshi in the Genesis block put a chancellor on brink of second bailout for banks. Well, around that same time, they introduced a, um, a help to buy scheme soon, soon after that. And it's, it was called Help to Buy, and the taxpayer would fund for a lucky few uh, individuals 20% uh, of their deposit for their properties because the property prices were too high because yeah. of all the money printing from QE to bail out the banks. So, um, yeah, that's the system. That's the system that most people like. If they could get a free home off the taxpayer, they'll take the free home. Uh, yeah. many, people, many people in crypto... Very few people in Bitcoin took those PPP loans, right? There was a whole, uh, anybody who took more than $100,000, I believe, were um, made public in the U.S. So remember, these were um, free loans. They were loans that you didn't actually have to pay back. Well, look at the number of billionaire crypto folk that uh, took those loans. Yeah. Uh, you know, this is what they do. That's their mindset. So I, it doesn't surprise me. I always think back to the quote from, Vladimir Lenin, supposedly he was talking to John Maynard Keynes, and he said that the best way to destroy capitalism is to debouch the currency through inflation. And he said at the end, uh, you lose all relation to money, and the best way to get rich is through gambling and theft. And like, yes. if that doesn't sum up sort of where the world is today, gambling and theft, the, to your point, all the altcoins, the gambling, the DeFi, uh, and the theft, right? Just outright theft everywhere. But I, uh, Max, I love that, uh, that shift that you, that you said, and that's actually kind of what I was thinking about and wanted to ask you about. When you think about fiat money crashing, what do you consider crashing? Uh, just because the governments have been able to stay in power and keep kicking the can down the road doesn't mean it's not crashing. But really, if you look at the societal impacts, I mean, it's bad. I mean, if you look at the, you know, the mortality rate in the U.S. is dropping, to your point, the social unrest happening all over the world, and you see it happening more you know, overseas. Um, the stuff that I'm seeing out of Europe seems really, really bad. I guess kind of what Stacy just said there about everybody wants to get that free house, not everybody, but a lot of people are happy to get that free house. And so I'm a little bit surprised and I just want to get your take on this. I kind of thought that with democracy being sort of this tyranny of the minority, if you will, like once, you know, 51% of the population has learned they could just vote themselves more money. Why wouldn't they just continue to vote themselves more money? Like why would they ever vote to give themselves less? And so it almost seems like there's no way out of it. Uh, but seeing what happened in Argentina, where like the people voted for a new president to like gut the whole you know government handout system, sort of shocked me. I don't know what, what, what were your thoughts on that? Maybe this this pendulum swinging and the people are ready to vote themselves less money. 
Right, well, we've called it the global insurrection against banker occupation, or GIABO. Mm -hmm. You know, we coined that phrase on our show maybe seven years ago, and it came after Occupy Wall Street. Remember, Occupy Wall Street was really mm -hmm. the first time activists targeted Wall Street and targeted the money centers as being the source of problems. And that meme, that idea has grown ever since. People are starting to understand that it's the bankers, it's the money, it's the central bankers, it's the Ron Paul ideas that have been talked about for many years. And uh, to your point about you know looting become a, becomes a way of life. I know Stacy refers to the Bastiat quote about this, and it's so it bears repeating. It's so true. Uh, looting essentially becomes a way of life, and it becomes normalized. And so, or I would say, I've said in interviews before, where if you took fraud out of the American system, there would be virtually no economy left. It's, it's, it's an economy based on fraud, built on fraud. And it, it's, um, without the fraud, there would be, there would be very little left. It's, it's a mechanism to encourage fraud. I would also add to that, of course, mentioning Argentina and then the US and Europe is that the Ponzi scheme nature of it means that, of course, the further you are from the money printing center, and there is only the U.S. dollar, right, in the fiat world. Everything else is based off of that, like trades against the U.S. dollar. So the U.S., what you see there, like they're just entering the debt forgiveness stage for the young people. What you saw in Argentina was that Millet won because of the young people. The young people are not the ones that get the money printing first. And all the debt and all the schemes that have been um, plundering Argentina for the last 20, 30 years has all gone to the boomers. Well, the same thing has happened in the U.S. and Europe, but the U.S. is able to uh, prolong it longer because they have the money printer. They have the number one money printer, and so they could start, you know, you see it in the U.S. with the discharging of the student debts. Every, every week or two, there's another new round of uh, debt forgiveness for millennials and Zoomers, right? So Argentina and Europe can't do that so easily like the U.S. can. And I think you're, that's why you're seeing uh, like massive political shifts in places like Europe and Argentina first. The U.S. has a higher tolerance. They'll be the last fiat man standing. And I think that's bad for them in a way. You know, I think they're going to be the last ones to... Uh, I guess the, the meek shall inherit the earth. It's, it's like the, yeah. the, weak, the, the, the they'll inherit the earth that they've created, that their fiat debts have created. Yeah, to add on to that point, in a recent conversation, an interesting point came out in that the world seems to be entering into this fourth turning, this idea, this convergence of various cycles yep. uh, at the end of kind of a nasty or beginning of a nasty period. But there seems to be one country that's, the first to emerge from the fourth turning, and that is El Salvador. El Salvador had already went through its horrendous uh, multi-decade collapse, and starting with the election of President Bukele in 2019, it has now emerged. It's emerging from that. So this is what makes El Salvador so interesting, is that it's really the first out of the box uh, to lead uh, the world in a way that people used to associate with the United States and other countries. But actually, El Salvador is becoming a world leader because it's already had the tough times. It now has the leader in President Bukele, and it is now showing the way, which is uh, why we're here, really, because we want to be a part of that. Yeah, I love that. And it, it feeds into, we'll, we'll move into that. And I, I, it feeds into what basically Stacy was just saying, where the U.S. will probably be the last one to move because the U.S. has everything to lose, right? And so it's like a business can't really disrupt themselves. That's why Kodak didn't introduce the digital cameras, you know, so to speak. And so since the U.S. sort of has the U.S. dollar the most to lose, they'll probably the, be the last to move, unfortunately. And in this world of game theory, the first mover has the advantage. And so El Salvador is certainly there. But Going back to sort of this game theory, and when you think about the way competition works, like competition always provides, you know, different tests and sh hopefully better service, better products, better prices, so to speak. And so to see El Salvador sort of stand up with this model and sort of demonstrate it for the world, um, it puts this game theory into play. The there's a lot riding on that though, right? Because like, because it is that first mover, it is this kind of model for the world, like it needs to be successful. I mean, is a lot, I mean, do you feel that pressure? Like a lot is hanging in the balance there? 
Yeah, we feel an enormous amount of pressure uh, to succeed. And you see, just as you said, that it is really important that we win. And we know this for a fact because the biggest loser will be the, the centers of power of the fiat system. And you see them wish for our failure the hardest and most vocally. So Washington, D.C., New York City, London, that's where you find the most FUD, the most anti-El Salvador, the most anti-Bukele sort of FUD is from those uh, centers of power in their media, uh, you know, lap dogs, right? So that's where you'll see the most negativity about us because they understand just how important it is for them that we fail. So we have, um, you know, Max and I really do work around the clock seven days a week here um, to make sure that we win, uh, in, you know, not only establishing that really solid foundation of, of you know, education system, of the, you know, the regulatory system and regime, the uh, pure excellence, like, so for example, look at what happened in New York City. Look at the number of collapses, Celsius, BlockFi, uh, SBF is through the U.S. system, even though it yeah. was nominally in the Bahamas. Like, they could get away with that. Nobody's, like, talking about the failure of the U.S. system. But had we had even one, like, even a, a tiny one, not right. even those multi-billion dollar collapses, if we had had a $100,000 or a $200,000 scam coin here, like we would have been like uh, shut out of the global system. Like they would have, like the media would have just like jumped for joy and just like pointed fingers at us. And this was a proof that uh, Bitcoin has failed there, sort of thing. So yeah. the the we know that we can only be gold medal like runners. Like we can only finish first. Like we we can't slip up at all. So we know this for for um, El Salvador and for Bitcoin, that we, we must win. When you say that it's so important that we succeed and that we win, what does success look like? I mean, is this like a path that you're on or is there like an end goal? Like what does success or winning look like? It looks like President Bukele, right? Like, look, the guy doesn't put one foot wrong. Like every, every speech he makes, every I told you so he tweets, that's, that's what winning looks like, right? Like everything we're doing is what winning looks like. So I think so far, like we have just been winning, 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 winning. And whether it's the homicide rate, we're now the safest in the Americas, right? Even the Spanish press is now wrote, wrote an article this past week where they were saying that uh, El Salvador is a miracle. The Bukele miracle, right? That they were following on what Colombia had written in their La Semana, the most read new, uh, magazine in the country, just a few months ago, said it's a Bukele miracle, right? Um, Colum Colombia said that. Yeah, Colombia uh, magazine in Colombia, the country. Wow. So they said um, it, on the cover, it said the Bukele miracle, and this is part and parcel. It's the same person. It's the same leader with the same, you know virtues, like fortitude, like patience, like all the things that President Bukele has that delivers not only Bitcoin, but also the security state, right? The, the, the peace and security that had long, um, you know, been unable, nobody here had peace or safety for 40, 50 years because plunder was a way of life for a group of men in this society. So they plundered rather than protected. And I think that's, you know, it, it it's totally makes sense that he would be a Bitcoiner and provide security, you know, secure those blessings of liberty so that you would have he, the, the leader of the country who gave you Bitcoin legal tender would also protect life, liberty, and property. And that's what he's done. Those are classic enlightenment ideals. That's what Bastiat said in the law when he said plunder, when plunder becomes a way of life for a group of men in society over the course of time, they create for themselves a legal system that authorizes it and, a, and a, a moral code that justifies it so or glorifies it. So yeah. that's, that's what we had here and that's what we no longer have. Like the, the legal code no longer authorizes it or justifies it or condones it and the moral code definitely has changed radically that we just want to be winners. That We don't want to be the losers that we were 
under that system of plunder. We want to be winners, and it feels good. Yeah. Um, for the listeners, she was uh, quoting from uh, The Law by Frederick Bastiat. Highly recommend reading the book. It's like an hour read. Uh, he was defining the term legal plunder, right? So they steal from you legally. They create the system. Uh, so go read that book. Um, but so winning is like not getting anything wrong and continuing to make progress both in life, liberty, and property to the point that you made. What about like a longer term? So like, you know, there was a lot of uh, FUD, if you will, coming out on El Salvador because of now the IMF isn't going to continue to give them loans and are they going to be able to pay it back and things like that? So is some of the success being able to like, say, build enough of an economy um, around tourism and industry that they're no longer, you know, dependent on the IMF for handouts? I mean, is that a big piece of that? And, and how realistic is that? Uh, well, the success looks like proof of work, right? Proof of work delivers success. And we work and work and work. And one of the metrics of success that Max and I look at and contrary to what the mainstream media, the Washington Post, the New York Times, the New Yorker, Bloomberg, Wall Street Journal have all written articles about El Salvador. And what they look at is they pick a metric that they decide is what matters, and that decides right. whether or not it's a success. And so they come here and they look to see if every single pupuseria is accepting Bitcoin. And therefore they say if they don't accept Bitcoin, just 20% they say accept Bitcoin, therefore adoption has not happened. Well, to me, what adoption matters is who around the world, the best and the brightest around the world, which of the best and the brightest are adopting El Salvador, not only as their home, their headquarters, but also like their spiritual home, like where they feel... Just like, uh, you know, in previous centuries, previous decades, people were spiritually connected to the United States and the, the notion of the republic that we stood for and the shining city on the hill. They really, uh, you know, they were spiritually connected to that. We meet people all the time that hadn't been to the U.S. but wanted to be in the U.S. They wanted to be citizens of the U.S. They wanted to move to the U.S. and work in the U.S. and build in the U.S. Well, that's the sort of adoption that we're looking for. So... For example, when you look at Silicon Valley in the 90s, you know, you didn't have Bloomberg and Wall Street Journal and Fo Financial Times go there and go to every cafe and see if they were, yeah. <laughs> if, if that cafe had Wi-Fi or an email address to see whether or not uh, the internet was catching on and whether or not they were adopting the internet. Well, no, they look, what, ha what was really going on was the best and the brightest uh, builders in the world of internet systems, of websites, of platforms, of, of the internet. They were there, right? And that's, and that's why it became the massive success that we believe will become. Like, that's what our future looks like for uh, Bitcoin capital markets and the uh, post-fiat world. Yeah, I think the, the fiat money system in, in has just driven our society to a point where we're just instant gratification on everything. And so everybody just expects way too much too soon. And to your point, you know, you wouldn't go to Silicon Valley and like, oh, it's been three years. How come everyone's not using it? You know, the Internet was around for two decades and we still had less than 10 percent people that ever bought anything online two decades later. So uh, things happen slowly. Um, so you have to sort of look at like the signposts along the way. And, and you can see a lot of that. And it starts with creating that freedom culture. <laughs> and these strong property rights. And, and it has to start there. And it's going to take a long time for that to start gaining traction. Um, and so you have to be happy with the progress, not just the end result of that. Um, but does the end result, and maybe this is three, four, five decades, I mean, the end result would hopefully that it could sort of get off of this debt money system and stop being dependent on um, the economic hitman, if you will, of the IMF. Yeah, well, we have a few things going in our favor here. Uh, first of all, you have what I call Bukelonomics, which um, we can Is that get different to. from Bidenomics? <laughs> the <Yeah>. opposite? <laughs> it's, uh, well, you know, it's, um, it's all about uh, private property and economic freedom, but there's also a push toward expanding the public domain. So you see, for example, uh, this new library that was open in historic downtown uh, San Salvador, that'll stand for 100 years, 150 years, that that's going to be a long-standing institution that will outlive everybody uh, around today, uh, but that's a public good, that's public, uh, pr the public domain is expanded. You know, I remember back in the 1960s, America celebrating freedom of speech gave us the pushback against the Vietnam War. It also, the United States government put a man on the moon, right? That was a government project. 
Right. So that was a combination of the two. So here you have President Bukele, who's all about economic freedom and Bitcoin, but he's also expanding the public domain and doing so in a radically transparent manner, in a very cost-efficient uh, way. And um, so I see this, these trends kind of continuing um, in, into the, the next five years of his presidency and really just being that beacon uh, of hope, that shining city on a hill. And you're going to just see a lot of folks mimicking that and emulating that and saying, you know, if they can do it, why can't we? So it's, it's just become this uh, tremendous um, power of example that's, that's changing people's minds. Uh, in terms of changing people's minds, what we're also doing here under President Bukele is changing the perception of El Salvador in a way that guarantees long-term success. So when he opened the library, what, in his speech, he, he referred to, in terms of the public space, being better than the private space. He referred to ancient Rome and ancient Greece. And if you think of Florence, like I always say what we're building here is Renaissance 2.0, that this is Florence 2.0. And if you, the reason why we know Medici is, yeah, he was a rich guy, right? But there were quite a few rich guys in the Italian city-states, right? There were some probably richer than Medici, but we don't remember them. Why don't we remember them? Because they didn't build a renaissance, right? They, right. they weren't the ones, I mean, they obviously participated, they followed uh, the Florin, they, you know, they copied the Florin in, in Venice. And, you know, of course, Venice was in, uh, also quite associated with the renaissance, but everybody remembers Florence because of what Medici did, what he left behind, what, like the David in the, in the public square, in Florence, now did Medici finance that with the hope of flipping it as an NFT? <laughs> or like, yeah. you know, was he hoping to flip it and gain more money? Or was he thinking that 500, 600 years from then, people would still be going to Florence and marveling at this masterpiece? You know, what, what we're creating here, and Max often says it, is a masterpiece, and I think President Bukele is creating a masterpiece here. Yeah. I took the family to uh, Florence this summer for the first time. And um, uh, I went on a, we hired a guide, went on a financial tour, toured the whole Medici thing. It was really awesome. And I was consistently just blown away by just how big, how grand all that stuff was. Right. But I mean, thinking about how much time, effort, energy, but how much money that cost to build back then. And Florence was just a textile hub. I mean, like fabrics. And then we went to Venice and I see all these like cathedrals. I mean, it just blows my mind. And um, it just made me think like only on a gold florin, only on a sound money standard could you do something like that. Like there's just no way we could do that today with inflation where it is. But going back to sort of uh, building that sort of monument and sort of f helping to fund that shift, I think it's even bigger. So like, sure, they left that stuff that we go look at today. Um, and it's still there. And like I said, I was just there. It was, it was amazing. But like really with El Salvador, sort of with this first mover advantage, it's not just about what's being built in El Salvador. It's what they could influence the rest of the world to do. And so really, uh, I, I'd love your take on this, seeing that you've lived around the world for 20 years. But, you know, South America, Central America, the Americas, if you will, you know, somewhat culturally different, obviously uh, much different than you might have in the Middle East and the Arab nations, et cetera. Um, but we have these like two different uh, paths that are being chosen, it seems like. So you have like El Salvador going, you know, pro-freedom, if you will. And then next door, Nicaragua, like they're going full communist. In South America, you have, you know, Chile adopting a communist constitution, Colombia adopting a communist, but then you have like Argentina going to a libertarian. So we're sort of seeing that playing out in real time. I mean, is that, is that how you're framing that? Is that how you're seeing that? Well, um, like Hayek said in that famous video in the 80s that uh, Austrian economics is, is great in theory, but, you know, we will never see it in practice because we'll always be subject to fiat money and the central bankers, only if by some workaround, by some right. sly mechanism, would we have a money that was separate from the state. Could we ever really see if this stuff would work? And at the time, people said, yeah, of course, that'll never happen. But in 2009, it did happen. 
money was created that separates money from state is totally decentralized money. And that's the key. You know, there's before Bitcoin and after Bitcoin. And El Salvador made Bitcoin legal tender and um, it matches perfectly with the leader, uh, President Bukele, is somebody who um, has leaned into that and seen that um, decentralization and giving power back to the people um, and letting the people decide. He's always making a reference to this. I'm here for the people. I serve the people. Let the people decide. And uh, has worked wonderfully here. So I think that for the first step for other countries is to understand the role Bitcoin plays in all of this. Obviously, in the communist countries, we know that there's it never works. So we know the end game there. It's failure. It always is 100% failure. In the case of countries that are going to rely on a fiat money standard, we know that now, definitively, after 300 years of experimentation, the central bank fiat money system is it failed. It didn't work. I also want to add to this, is this. There will never be another El Salvador, I believe, not for another 500 years, because that's the thing. When you talk about communism or capitalism or, or Republican Party or Democratic Party, these are like political parties and political ideas that are now dead. President Bukele is a leader, and we don't know what that looks like. That's not something that we, in a modern history, have any sort of, um, we don't recognize that. We don't know what he is because we've never seen a leader like that. This, he's a one in 500 year sort of leader. And when I, I mean, there's only been like, maybe 50 mostly men throughout history who have been leaders, right? And he's one of them. So to have that is very hard work. And there, how you know that the, nobody recognizes what it is, is that they keep on calling him a miracle or the Bekele miracle, that it's like divine, it's some, from out of this world, it's nothing that we've seen before. But that's because we don't create leaders anymore. You know, Alexander the Great, who was his, uh, his teacher, was like one of the three greats of philosophy, Aristotle, Socrates, or Plato. You know, like, I think it was Aristotle. So like, they were trained to be great. He was trained to be great. He was destined to be great because that was how we trained people back then. That's what mattered back then. And I think President Bukele, and by the way, all his brothers, so I think it's... Um, like he was trained, his family uh, taught them those virtues. Like if you look up the cardinal virtues or the heavenly virtues, like, and you look at just through his actions, not just his words, look through his actions and see how many of those, you know, that he had. So how, how many he has, right? And, you know, I, I always talk about the fortitude and patience, like, because those are the things that stand out to me the most, and especially the fortitude. Like, he, he stood really firm when all of the world was mocking and laughing at El Salvador for adopting Bitcoin, and then soon after for, um, you know, securing the right, rights to life, liberty, and property for the people. Like, they were calling him horrible names and jeering and, and threatening uh, El Salvador because of you know, kicking out the gangs and arresting the gangs and stopping them from plundering the people. Well, he was, you know, he, he remained firm and believed in his vision of what he saw El Salvador is becoming. So that's why I think, and I said this on the stage at Miami 2023, is that I don't think there will be another one, not because, you know, uh, I'm like in some cult or uh, drinking some Bukele Kool-Aid. I just think from my own observation, even not knowing him personally, but just through his actions as a leader, you could see that we're not going to have, we haven't had a leader like this for many, many hundreds of years. Like, it, especially if you put it into the context, we've had great orators, and that's one important ingredient to have, be a great leader, to have that ability to persuade. But we've never had somebody overcome the obstacles that were in the way of somebody like President Bukele running the most dangerous country on earth in, in debt and impoverished country. So that he overcame those and that we're treated 
at, like that, that the world knows our name now is quite remarkable for this little country. Well, yeah. to Stacy's point, so if in fact El the El Salvador Bukele miracle is irreproducible, and uh, instead of waiting for another country to become the next El Salvador, the only option would be to move to El Salvador. So I think that's what's going to be driving a lot of folks to actually move to El Salvador. And we see that in the numbers, right? The number of people at the southern border in the United States who are fleeing South America and Central America, well, one country is an outlier, and that is El Salvador. There's now almost equilibrium. There's now almost as many people fleeing to El Salvador wow. as there are people leaving El Salvador. So that speaks to the uniqueness of what's happening here. And I also want to bring it back to Florence because, again, like there were a, ver a load of very wealthy rulers of the other city-states, and yeah, they did finance some public art, and yeah, they did finance some of the same artists, and they did uh, copy the Florin, and they had the Ducat and other like currencies like that. But it was Medici more than just that. It wasn't just he was rich. It wasn't just that he had good taste, aesthetic taste, and. Um, who was it that said recently that, um, oh, the, the, the ambassador to El Salvador from China mentioned in, in that public um, of the inauguration of the, um, the library, he, he mentioned how that President Bukele, who Max calls a philosopher king, that he has this amazing aesthetic taste. Well, yeah, okay, so Medici had that. But what he, Medici also had was fortitude, of course. And that's... A, that's the strength of character is very difficult to have. Uh, remember, he stood up against the Vatican, and the Vatican, the Pope um, excommunicated the entirety, the entire population of Florence because they stood behind Medici, and they stood behind Medici because Medici stood behind them. So uh, that was, in those days, it was a very powerful tool to cut somebody off, to excommunicate them from the church. It's the equivalent of excommunicating of sanctioning from SWIFT, for example. So those sort of threats get issued today from the modern papacy that is the, you know, the New York Fed and the, and the Washington, D.C. elite. So that, those are their sort of tools. And yet, you know, the population here stood behind President Bukele throughout everything and the same that happened in Florence. So... There are many, many traits. Well, there are seven uh, virtues. <laughs> another parallel that I'm just thinking of as you're talking it through is back to what I said earlier about this long-term perspective. And so Medici was building these buildings that were taking forever. I mean, some of them, some of these things he was doing wouldn't even be around, you know, in his lifetime, for example. And um, what, you know, what Bukele's doing in El Salvador, he probably, you know, he may not be alive to see really the full fruit of what he's planting right now today. And just compare that to Biden in the United States. I mean, just this week or now last week, the Fed pivoted off of their stance of tightening monetary policy because we have an election coming up. It's like, let's just focus on the next nine months. <laughs> like, forget about my kids and my grandkids. Let's focus on the next nine months. And so it's like, that's a in stark contrast. You know, another stark contrast is um, you have Europe putting in these uh, laws over the internet, which is basically going to make them like have a great firewall like China. I mean, like literally that's like the path they're going down. Um, and so we see this like one shift towards uh, more communism, if you will, and one going towards more freedom. I want to go back to what you'd said, uh, Stacey, because I'm pretty interested in this. Um, I've been trying to get information from you guys since you left to go down to El Salvador. But you talked about, um, you know, now starting to attract some of the best and the brightest people into El Salvador. Um, I think, you know, people, to your point, sort of attached to it spiritually. They want to go to a place that has freedom. And even though it may not be as nice as where they're at, they're, the, the direction is right. Um, and if there's strong private property rights and freedom, then this is a good place to start businesses and things like that. So what is the path now? I know they just recently announced some sort of initiative to get people to come down there. Um, there's like a new uh, freedom passport or something like that. It's like, what's the path for somebody to come down, uh, move down there, start a business, invest into the company, uh, country, build companies, et cetera? Well, of course you can email us at the Bitcoin office, onbtc at presidencia.gov.sv, and we will help uh, you know onboard any Bitcoiners also, we will be having a, a, a website soon for Bitcoiners in particular. 
We have a Freedom Passport, and that is part of our Renaissance 2.0 and attracting the best and the brightest. So you can see what President Bukele has managed in just two years. Yes, I mean, he's been in office for four years, but for the first two years, he did not have a, a, any control of Congress. So for two years now, you've seen what he's done with the ability to lead. And what he's done is quite remarkable. Not only has he transformed the economy through Bitcoin, but he's transformed, he's rebranded the country from the most dangerous on earth to the coolest place that everybody wants to be, right? So he's rid the country of gangs that had plagued the country for decades. He rid the country of these two plunder politics, right? These two parties that plundered the nation over and over. Like when we're, when we're doing a lot of work for, with volcano energy and the Bitcoin mining here, one of the things you note is that a lot of the electric grid had, was basically plundered for f the past 40, 50 years by those two parties. They didn't, any money that came towards uh, investing in the grid, they just stole it. Mm -hmm. The president of the time would steal it and flee to Nicaragua or flee to the United States. There's one, one former president of El Salvador that stole a billion dollars and wow. he's, he's, he's in the U.S. being harbored there. So uh, th that I saw, I saw Zelensky's buying like a $20 million house in uh, Florida now. <laughs> Same exactly. Thing. Yeah. Exactly. So uh, that's what we had here, and that's what's over, and he's done that in just two years. So what we're trying to attract is, yes, we already have like the best and brightest coming here in terms of a lot of Bitcoiners uh, moving here, uh, individuals and entrepreneurs and companies setting up headquarters here, and that's the sort of adoption we want to see. Um, you know, there is a pretty easy path to uh, re certainly residency here. Um, it doesn't cost much and it's pretty easy. You could just move here. You don't need, you know, it's not difficult like say moving to Canada or uh, the United Kingdom. It's super easy and pretty cheap. Now with our Freedom Passport, which is a million dollars, it's one million dollars. It's a very, very fast path to passport. Most people should uh, qualify within six weeks. They get a new passport. Uh, based on our KYC, criminal background check, all the stuff you have to do, but it's a million dollars, and what they're, it's a donation, it's a citizenship by donation, it's not an investment, there's no big, vast bureaucracy around this, it's like you're, uh, you're donating to what President Bukele is doing. He's expanding the domain, the public domain of economic liberty. That is his policy. Bitcoin, by the way, falls under his larger policy, of economic liberty. Economic liberty also encapsulates what he's done with the security and, and, and you know, securing life, liberty, and property for the people. So you're, you're basically, set, you know, it's attracting a lot of very early Bitcoiners, Bitcoin whales, uh, billionaires who uh, want to be the one who, to make a change. They want to leave a legacy, right? Like, because anybody could go buy a passport in St. Kitts and hang out with Roger Ver for $250,000, dollars But here, you could be in the history books as part of, like, if Medici had invited you to come have dinner with him and, and Da Vinci and uh, Machiavelli uh, and, all, you know, all Botticelli and all the cool people hanging out, Michelangelo hanging out in Florence, like, you would do it, right? You would pay a million dollars to be at that table and be have a say in in building the future that Florence did achieve. Yeah. So a million dollars if you want to fast track it and donate to the cause and sort of have that passport. Otherwise, anybody could move down there, start a business and just apply for, I guess, probably temporary residency, then get a permanent residency and sort of go down that path. It's probably a five-year path, I'm guessing. It's a five-year path and you can go, there's two sort of entities that could help you with onboarding to to that path of residency and business formation and ultimately citizenship. And that would be uh, accelerate sv.io. So accelerate sv is the is the country symbol for El Salvador uh, .io. And the other is Aso Bitcoin, the Association of Bitcoin in El Salvador. So asobitcoin.org. And uh, they're also on Twitter. So you could go to them. You know, it's it's like 
I don't know, don't quote me on the numbers, but it's like less than $1,000 to uh, get legal help to help you on board. But you could do it yourself if you can read Spanish. And a lot of it is in English if you go to the uh, migration website uh, of El Salvador and you could uh, figure your way out there. It might be less than $100 to apply for a residency visa. What are some of the like long-term risks here? And um, I think, if I'm not mistaken, you had told me that Bukele sort of like stepped down, so he's re he's rerunning for election potentially. Um, you know, a lot of people had accused him of being a dictator because of the way that he had to sort of reform the court system. The you know the the two political parties, to your point. Um, I don't know if he stepped down, he's rerunning, correct me if I'm wrong, but maybe to sort of prove that, like, hey, I didn't just take this over, you can reelect me if you want. Um, do these run on, like, four-year cycles like the U.S.? And, like, what happens if there's a color revolution he doesn't get reelected in four years from now? Um, like, what does that look like? Uh, it's five-year terms here, and he's following the Constitution. The Supreme Court year said that uh, if he if he steps down or, if he, like, he takes a leave of absence for six months, prior to the inauguration, which is June 1st, uh, then that uh, qualifies under the Constitution, which was written during the military dictatorship in the 80s, early 80s. Um, so he's doing that in terms of, I, I don't think there's going to be a color revolution. The U.S. has seen with their own two eyes the remarkable achievements here, and the U.S. ambassador, who was only appointed in 2023, uh, the U.S. ambassador to El Salvador, who is a he's a really good guy. He's um, he's a lifelong diplomat, and so he's less uh, political. For example, like a lot of U.S. ambassadors are, you know, friends of the president. This guy, he's a you know a, a g smart, good guy, and he's honest. And he said what he saw here, and what he saw here was the people living in freedom for the first time that he's ever seen, and he's been here many times over the past few decades. So he believes, and the, and the United States believes, that um, that there's now peace and security here, and life is being protected, and the people are happy. And they said recently, and including the um, somebody from the State Department was here, and they said that let the people decide, because you know, we believe in democracy, so let, if, if the people don't like it, then on February 4th, they can say, they can let their voice be heard at the, at the ballot box. And the polls, Gallup shows that uh, basically about 93% plan on voting for him and, and his party. Mm. Uh, let's talk about uh, some predictions here, Max. Um, <laughs> Not price predictions, if you wanted to, you could throw that out there. But um, we have, right now, we're sort of sitting on the precipice of potentially multiple ETFs getting approved, um, potentially here in weeks, although they're quickly changing the registration to where they're, I guess, not physical now. There's going to be cash settled, so it sort of defeats the whole purpose. But as that's happening, you know, the evil empire BlackRock wants to launch their ETF, et cetera. Um, while that's happening, almost in unison, we have uh, Elizabeth Warren um, passing this horrible bill that would basically make, uh, could, could potentially make Bitcoin and, and cryptocurrency illegal, potentially. Um, and potentially the attack vector there is like this self-custody. Maybe I'm reading in this too much, but like if they could take away the ability to self-custody, but you can own it through BlackRock, so to speak. Uh, do you think those two things are, are, are coming together sort of in unison for a cause? And if so, does that I would imagine help what El Salvador is doing. I mean, uh, if I can't own it in the U.S., I mean, maybe I'll own it on paper, but then I can move down to El Salvador and custody it myself at some point. The answer would be yes, uh, but to give some more details there. So, yeah, the ETFs. It's interesting. I've been in finance for over forty years, and to see the coordination and the multiple launch of a product simultaneously like this is highly unusual. I've never seen it quite before. So I think there is an agenda going on. And S simultaneously, you're saying like the laws and the ETF launched together? I'm saying that multiple ETFs being launched oh. uh, simultaneously uh, uh, from 15 different financial institutions right. uh, are all have an ETF in the works. Usually it's, you know, first mover advantage and somebody comes up with an ETF and they kind of get the market and they are like the GLD, for example, mm. was launched. And I believe it's either HSBC or JP Morgan are the custodian behind that. And they launched it and they captured the blind share of the market and they have that product. 
And that's typically the way products are launched. But here they're saying to Wall Street, we want you to coordinate a product launch simultaneously amongst all of you financial institutions. So that looks like there's a highly uh, politicized, looks like a highly politicized uh, kind of coordination going on there. Simultaneously, Liz Warren is saying what she's saying and attacking Bitcoin and so-called crypto. So to your point, that is this set up a situation where the public is only allowed to own ETFs, which are derivative of Bitcoin and cash settled, similar to gold. You know, if, if gold gets into, GLD gets into trouble, they have the ability to settle in cash. They don't have to send you gold. They can send you fiat money. To your exact phrase, it defeats the purpose. So an ETF, Bitcoin, that's settled in cash is almost point. But nevertheless, um, it will bring in a lot of capital. Simultaneously, they could say, well, self-custody of Bitcoin, according to Liz Warren, could be banned. So now you have a situation where only the government can own actual Bitcoin, and, but the public can only own a derivative. Now, would that help El Salvador? Of course, because everybody who has lost their Bitcoin in a tragic boating accident <laughs> would immediately yeah. book a flight to El Salvador yeah. uh, because uh, the leadership here would recognize this is a huge opportunity. Uh, President Bukele is a fantastic leader, and like all fantastic leaders, his ideas are fantastic, plus he capitalizes on other people's mistakes. Like yeah. when other countries make a mistake, he jumps in and capitalizes on that mistake. That's part of being a, a leader, I think. And so if these other countries want to make that mistake, El Salvador is happy to be the beneficiary. Yeah. I also, I think, I also, think, I also think that what they're going to do is they know for a fact they can't outlaw Bitcoin. They know that because they know that it's genuinely decentralized and that there is no CEO and there is nobody to arrest. Um, so, and it's global. So it's, it's more difficult that, to do like a gold confiscation sort of scheme like they did in the 1930s. So I think what they're going to do is they present this whole, like, we're going to ban everything and we're going to arrest you all. And then they'll say, like, okay, what we're really going to ban is any coin with a CEO or a marketing budget and a marketing department. Those are easy to uh, criminalize, right? Those, because there is somebody to contact. So they'll do those first. Um, and... They clearly, however, Gary Gensler has said it, all the, the chairman of the CFTC, all the officials have, you know, they're pretty good at like signaling to you with their words. Like if you actually listen to the stuff they say, they've told you years ago that Bitcoin is a commodity, everything else is a security. So I think that's what they'll do. They're not going to, they're not going to ban it. Like Liz Warren is playing the crazy person, right? This, this is just good cop, bad cop. This is just yeah. a negotiation tactic. And what they're going to do is they're going to regulate all, well, they're going to do kind of what we did here. Bitcoin is money and everything else is a security. Because if you didn't say everything else is a security, what uh, the shit coiners and scammers said is like, well, you haven't like defined us, so we get to operate with impunity. Well, no, like it's against the law to scam people. And uh, here... Here's your avenue to uh, register as a security, tell everybody that they're going to lose their, all their money, and like, you know, the warning you know, the symbols on the back of the cigarette package showing you're going to die, you're right. most likely <laughs> going to die smoking. Yeah. Yeah. The same thing with the, like a shit coin is like, you're going to lose all your wealth, you're going to end up poor, you're going to end up like, we're going to put photos of, of homeless bums on the street you know, yeah. just mm -hmm. passed out sleeping under a stairwell. And that's basically your future on the shit coin. But, okay, you knew and nobody's, because in a hard money economy, there's nobody there to bail you out from your dumb mistakes. Like this ain't the U.S. dollar sort of fiat money system here. We don't have our own printed currency to print and bail you out from your dumb mistakes. Right. Yeah, my fear is just you see things like the Restrict Act they put into place and what Elizabeth Warren's doing is like any interfacing with any piece of software or technology that they deem to be a threat to national security could be illegal. And, uh, and you know, they're, they're using words like, oh, it's a threat to our financial stability. So is that a threat to our security? Hopefully we're a long way from that. The Supreme yeah. Court won't allow it. They've already done this dozens of times. And every new tyrant in, in the Senate thinks they could, uh, like, argue differently. But the Supreme Court has always 
backed free speech. They've always backed code. They've always done that. Like so, I don't think um, I, do, I don't think there's any chance in hell of her getting what she wants. Maybe just she she, she might be able to pass it, but the Supreme Court's going to rule against her. Yeah, remember, Bitcoin separates money from state, and that's that's as accurate. That's true. Is saying that gold is element number seventy nine on the periodic table. That's it's a statement of fact. Yeah. And now the state is trying to trying to snatch it back. But the vector that Bitcoin is on, it has achieved escape velocity. Mm. And that no state will be able to try to bring it back on, in the fold. It's gone. It, they, 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 they messed up. It's gone. Yeah. yeah. Austin, Austin Goolsby was right about that. He said we should have killed it while we had the chance, you know, he being under uh, President Obama. But, uh, and, and Satoshi himself, like, messaged said as such during, um, like when WikiLeaks first got involved in Bitcoin in 2010, he was worried, he expressed concern, saying that we're, you know, like we're too young and we're too small to uh, we, battle we kick the, the hornet's war. nest, he said. Yes, yes, the kick the hornet's nest, that's, that's what he said. Yeah. And uh, so he, he was right, but luckily, well, the U.S. Was, had multiple war fronts at that time, and, and it was too small, and they didn't think it was going to be a threat. So um, they just thought it was Max and Stacy on Kaiser <laughs> Report. So uh, they were wrong. The thing about money, Mark, as you always bring up, is that it is a, code, a coded way to promote freedom. Right. It's a, um, it's, and so Bitcoin is perfect money, and therefore it, it satisfies something in us as human beings. So as long as humans still want to be human, Bitcoin will be on that vector going away from the state. And the state was always ends up coalescing and becoming powerful to the extent of snuffing out freedoms. Yep. And this, therefore, this, this battle against money versus the state has been lost by the state. They, they have lost. They are dead. The only thing left now is to bury them. They're the walking dead. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in uh, Alex Fetsky and I, in our book, The Uncommunist Manifesto, we, we sort of made the case that capitalism is not a political modality. Capitalism is just natural emergent order. We as humans have private property and we use our intellectual ability and private property to trade freely. And that's just the way the world works, right? Kids are tra trading sandwiches for chips or whatever. Uh, I had a fire, you had an animal, we share that, right? Um, and so if that is natural and emergent, then we need a way to trade. And so we need some form of medium of exchange. <laughs> and that's just human nature. The government can't really co-opt that. They could try for a time, but to your point, Max, like it's already failed. It will fail, it will already fail. Um, and now we're just kind of seeing that play out. In, in El Salvador, we have a leader that does the personification of this who recognizes this, who's a natural leader based on natural values, ancient yeah. values. And so you marry that with Bitcoin and people are paying a million dollars in donation to be a part of it. Yeah. Well, uh, we've covered a lot. I, uh, as someone, I mean, Max, Max and Stacey, both of you guys have been pounding the table on Bitcoin longer than anybody. You guys were the psychopaths screaming at the top of your lungs from the streets. Uh, but it just continues to, you know, play out uh, the way that you see it. And a lot of it's because it is that natural emergent process. And this is just sort of how the world works. Um, so anyway, I appreciate you guys sharing that. I really appreciate you guys being down there in El Salvador and banging the drum on that as well. Um, I love to see this pendulum swinging. I love to see this competition being set up. Uh, we're all rooting for it to win. Did you have something you want to add, Stacey? Yes. First, I want to mention, because we haven't said it the whole episode is this during this whole interview, is we're talking like Zoomers now, by the way. We might be... Uh, He's a boomer. I'm almost. I'm a Gen X, but uh, we're we're talking like Zoomers here because this is the new way of them doing it. They hold their yeah. labs in their hand. <laughs> Even Bloomberg, I've noticed this in my Twitter stream or my sorry, my X stream that they're yeah. always uh, holding these. Um, but I just want to say that, and also that if you're interested in acquiring freedom, you could apply for freedom here in El Salvador for one million dollars. You, your spouse, your dependent children, all get a passport within six weeks if you go to adoptingelsalvador.gob.sv. So just go there uh, and forward slash freedom if you want double the freedom. <laughs> yeah. So, We're going to make uh, sure we uh, link that in the show notes down below. The one thing I just want to add to that, that Stacy's talking about, and if you've been listening to this interview, we talk about this long-term perspective. And so, like, you know, I just keep reminding myself, like, 
I mean, I'm kind of old now too. And like, I got enough money. I could just like go disappear and ride out the rest of my life on the beach, but I got kids and I got grandkids and like, we need a legacy. Like, I mean, this is bigger than just us and our short lifetime that we have back to the Medici's or whatever, these leaders that build for future generations. And so, uh, be a part of it, be a part of something bigger than yourself. And, and that lasts much longer, hopefully. I agree. Do it. Adopt El Salvador. Adopt El Salvador. All right, we'll go ahead and sign it off. Um, uh, we'll put the link to that uh, Adopting Bitcoin the pa passport down in the link below. And with that, we'll sign it off. Thanks so much, guys. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you.